Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told on Untold. My name is Tsuhu. For today's video, I am going to be telling you guys the tragic story of Bruno Braun. Bruno was a well-known prominent figure in the local gay community in Cape Town and he owned a gay club called The Bronx alongside his late partner Jono and they started this nightclub around the 1990s and it was the cornerstone of what would later be known as the Pink Strip. The Bronx was a safe haven for a lot of gay people in Cape Town in the early 2000s and this is because people weren't as accepting as they are today of people in the LGBTQ community so the Bronx was a place that people could go to to be themselves, to mingle without any judgement from other people, you know, and just have fun and other people kind of saw what the Bronx was able to accomplish with people within the community and because of this a lot of other business started opening up on Somerset Road in Cape Town. There were restaurants that opened up, there were gay clubs, like other gay clubs as well and development also increased in this area because of the tourists that it would bring and the Bronx kind of started this. Bruno and Jono were both business and life partners and they were described as the sort of power couple but most people knew who Jono was before they knew who Bruno was and everyone described Jono as this bold nice guy that she would always see so friendly you know a people person and after he and Bruno started dating they would see Bruno come around more often and it got to the point where you wouldn't see Jono without Bruno and and vice versa. But unfortunately in the mid 2000s Jono unfortunately passed away. Bruno was completely heartbroken by Jono's passing and their friends say that he never really recovered from Jono's death. He would keep to himself, he was always in the house that he and Jono shared with their dogs and because he was always cooped up in the house he wouldn't go see like his friends or anything like that. The Bronx also started deteriorating things wouldn't get fixed on time and it just really wasn't the same and because Bruno and Jono were such good business partners he kind of didn't know how to run the Bronx by himself and you could see that after Jono's passing. It was Bruno's dream to entertain the gay community on a world-class scale. He supported the gay community and every single year he would sponsor the Pride Festival and there would also be a bronze float and he would lead that float during pride. However, during Bruno's mourning period, he kind of did a complete 180 from like this really kind, loving person to someone who was quick to anger, short-tempered, and he just really wasn't pleasant to be around. Because of Jono's loss, he just like you could actually see that he just wasn't the same person. Bruno's friends tried to encourage him to start dating again but because Bruno wouldn't leave the house it was kind of hard for him to meet like someone in person so they tried to encourage him to do like online dating but he hated computers so just being online and like speaking to someone was just something he wasn't going to do. But in 2011 that all changed when a man named John Kotzer started working as a bouncer at the Bronx. Bruno had a little crush on John and this is because John was his type. John was rough, he was edgy, he was like hardcore, everything that Bruno kind of looked for in a man. And not too long after that, Bruno and John did start a sexual relationship with one another. And immediately like Bruno's staff and his friends could tell that he was happier, like he wouldn't have his anger outbursts anymore, he was nicer, you know, he was a lot easier to handle and people were happy for him. But it wasn't the same for John. John was kind of described as a person who would start seeing you because he saw what he could get out of you and for Bruno he saw that he could gain money, you know, it had financial benefits and for a while Bruno didn't see that and other people could but eventually he did see what John was doing and John was kind of like hoping to achieve. 
John and Bruno didn't have like a conventional relationship. They weren't like each other's partners, like, oh, this is my partner, this is my partner type thing. It was more of like a sexual oriented relationship. And people described their relationship as like kinky, fetish orientated, dark, something that most people weren't used to. And it confused a lot of people. And even Bruno's domestic helper, she once brought it up because she thought it was so odd how John would always be over like at Bruno's house, but he would never spend the night. Like he would come and just leave after a couple of hours. And she also just thought it was just a bit odd and strange and a lot of people knew about John and Bruno's relationship however John would always deny that he was in any sort of relationship with Bruno whether it be romantic or just sexual he kept saying that he and Bruno were just friends you know like friends that's my boss we have like a friendly relationship nothing else like nothing more than that but everyone knew that he was lying so it's kind of like why are you lying about it we all know what you're doing you know about six months before the tragic events of today's case Bruno would continuously tell his friends that he didn't want to be with John anymore but John wouldn't let him go like John would blatantly refuse for their relationship to end and it kind of got to the point where John started harassing him on one occasion at around three or four in the morning Bruno was asleep and he heard the bell ring like by his front gate so Bruno's house is kind of like it was his house like on the ground floor and then he had stairs that she climbed up to to get to the gate so he heard his dogs barking so he decided to get out of bed climbed up the stairs got to the gate and saw no one was there so he decided to go back to bed and as he climbed down the stairs and got in front of his house he saw John sitting there waiting for him and John just said you didn't think you'd get rid of me that easily right like imagine how scary that was on the 6th of February 2012, Bruno was calling his friends telling them that he needed help because John kind of just wouldn't leave him alone and John would be in his house after climbing the walls like to get into his yard. Like John was very persistent. The next day on the 7th of February, Bruno's domestic helper walked into the house and she was completely taken aback because the house was a mess and that's not how Bruno was. Bruno was described as someone who was a neat freak like borderline OCD. He would notice if anything was out of place like if you made yourself a sandwich he would notice when there were breadcrumbs and like would clean it up or he'd get upset you know like that's the type of person he was. So as soon as she saw this she like immediately knew that something was wrong because the house never looked like this like if you knew Bruno you knew that this wasn't him this isn't what he's house is supposed to look like and after just searching the house and looking around she eventually found the body of Bruno Braun. Police officers and a forensic team soon arrived on the scene and they started looking for any clues and evidence and the first thing they kind of noticed was how secured Bruno's house was so that kind of was the first indication that Bruno probably knew who his murderer was because he willingly let them into his home. So as you're outside of Bruno's house, there's a patio and bright area that kind of leads to an outside flat. And this outside flat is where Bruno's close friends say that he and John engaged in their sexual activities in. And they didn't do it inside like the main house in the main bedroom because Bruno didn't want to have another man in the bed that he shared with Jono. You know, for him it was kind of like disrespectful to have another man in the bed that he shared like with his life partner so that's why they were kind of just engaged with their stuff in the flat outside and ironically this is where Bruno's body was found. Detectives found cigarette butts on the patio leading to the flat and inside the room Bruno was found on the floor only in his shorts he was lying face upwards and had a green rug partially draped over him. And when police removed the rug, they found that his hands were tied with a leather belt, his face was covered with a blood-stained white towel, and his legs were covered in bruises, and his knees and elbows showed severe carpet burns. 
His autopsy showed that he had been strangled and he died of asphyxia. Police officers also discovered that his laptop, cell phone and silver BMW were missing and neighbors heard the BMW speeding off the night before. Later that night, someone drove past Bruno's house and they saw that it was cordoned off and there were police officers everywhere and immediately they called one of his friends just to let him know what was happening and asked him if he could drive past just to find out what was happening and if something had happened to Bruno and this friend said that immediately as soon as he received this phone call he knew what had happened and his first thought was that John Kutzer did it. Within days police officers arrested four suspects. Frederick Willem John Kotzer, Fariz Ali and Ahmed Dov, all three of them were charged with aggravating circumstances and all pleaded not guilty. The fourth suspect, Kurt Espy, quickly turned state witness and he said that he was John's friend and he worked for John's mom's security company and he said that on that night he had driven John but he didn't know anything about Bruno's murder until the next day and he didn't even know that they had stolen any items from his house. So what happened that night is that John, Ahmed and Fariz had driven to Ocean View Drive to Bruno's house that night and John told him the reason why they had to go to Bruno's house that night was because that they had got into like an argument and they had to go and fetch some of his things and they had went to Bruno's house at around 11 p.m. After this, all three of their stories start changing and then police officers had to let them go on bail and whilst they were out on bail, police officers tried to just figure out the correct story and the events that happened that night. Whilst John was out on bail, one of Bruno's friends actually saw him at a shopping complex and as soon as John saw this friend, he literally just gave this friend the middle finger, like he didn't care. Finally, in October 2013, the trial finally began at Cape Town High Court. John tried framing Ahmed and Fariz and the two men joined together and blamed John for Bruno's death. However, as police officers were going through all the evidence, it all pointed to one person and that was John. The state argued that John needed money to pay for his outstanding drug debts so he went to Bruno's house that night to try and get some money and one thing led to another and he ended up killing Bruno. Kurt testified that John asked to be dropped off on the road below Ocean View Drive where Bruno's house was at the bottom of a flight of stairs leading up to the road around 11 p.m. A neighbor also testified that she heard an unusual sound around the same time that night and not too long after that she heard someone asking for help and when she responded someone else replied to her that everything was okay. She also saw someone opening the sliding door at Bruno's home and walking out whilst they were on the phone and this person fit the description of John. And about 30 minutes after that, Fariz and Ahmed arrived, to, arrived at Bruno's house and not too long after that, Bruno's silver BMW was heard speeding off and it is believed they used the car to put all of the stuff that they had stolen and they later sold everything for drugs. The most incriminating evidence against John was from DNA. They found DNA under Bruno's fingernails that showed signs of a struggle. They also found DNA on, a, on the leather belt that was used to bind his hands together as well as on the towel that was used to strangle Bruno and all of this DNA belonged to none other than John Otzer. During the trial, there was one day where the court proceedings for the day were done and all of Bruno's friends kind of rushed out of the courtroom and got into the lift and as the doors were closing, a hand stopped the doors and there stood John. One of Bruno's friends kind of pushed him out and told him that the lift was full and afterwards the door started closing again and John did the same thing and then he got into the lift and the doors closed. And all of Bruno's friends were literally in the lift with this guy that had killed their friend. And they couldn't do anything. They just had to like stand there and wait for the lift to get to the ground floor until it opened. And all of them kind of just got out of that lift. And I can't imagine like how awkward and just infuriating that would have been. Like 
Can you imagine? In 2014, Frederick Willem John Kotzer was found guilty of murdering Bruno Braun and sentenced to life imprisonment. Fariz Ali and Ahmed Dorf were acquitted on the murder and robbery charges. There are many questions that still remain unanswered, so let's get into some theories that Bruno's friends have. The first theory is that John went to Bruno's house looking for money. There were rumors that Bruno kept large sums of cash in his house and one friend told the story that about two years before Bruno's death he told this friend that he had 900,000 Rand in cash and about two months before his death he told the same friend that he had only about 200,000 left and he had used all that money to try and keep the Bronx afloat after Bruno died his friends went to the house and tried looking for the money but they couldn't find it the second theory is that John went to Bruno's house that night with the intention to extort money but somehow they got into a fight, one thing led to another and after that John killed him and then called Ahmed and Fariz so they could rob the house. The third and final theory is that Bruno was maybe making too much noise. As you know, he didn't want to see John anymore. John was very persistent, wouldn't leave him alone. So when he called out for help and John heard the neighbor like hearing the noise, he decided to try and keep him quiet and maybe he was too rough and one thing led to another and that's how he accidentally killed Bruno. A lot of people were saddened by Bruno's death, but they will always remember him as someone who helped the LGBT community in more ways than one and changed their lives forever. And that's it for today's case. If you guys have any comments, please leave them down below and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.